All right. Good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone joining us today. On behalf of USAID and Resilience Links, I welcome you to our theme month webinar on disaster risk financing and shock responsive social protection in Malawi, hosted by Laura Evans, Social Protection Advisor with USAID's Center for Resilience. I am Jamie Charles with Resilience Links. Before we begin, let me orient you to the Zoom platform. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, if you haven't done so already, please use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're joining us from. To ask questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A button. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and will email you the post-event resources shortly following the event. You can also find these resources on resiliencelinks.org. Thank you for your attendance today. And I'll now pass it to Michael Coons, Senior Knowledgement Advisor for USAID's Center for Resilience. Thank you, Jamie. And thanks to the entire Resilience Links team for organizing this webinar to discuss the role of social protection and strengthening resilience. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to see such an impressive turnout today. I'd like to start out by saying that on behalf of the Center for Resilience, we really appreciate this discussion forum that Resilience Links has created. The monthly webinars and newsletters on resilience themes are a great way to share knowledge and learn about the growing community of practitioners and how they are designing and implementing programs to strengthen resilience among households, communities, and systems. At USAID, we consider resilience as the ability to adapt and manage through adversity and change without compromising future well being. USAID resilience policy underscores the importance of supporting transformative capacities including formal and informal social protection mechanisms. The idea here is that shock responsive social protection is a key source of resilience, as it employs a full range of development and humanitarian assets in anticipation of shocks to mitigate their impact and speed recovery once conditions subside. Hey, this is the second time you've done that. We're looking forward to today's discussion and we appreciate the opportunity to learn about the growing body of evidence demonstrating that strengthened social protection systems are essential to achieve and maintain well-being outcomes in the face of conflict, climate, COVID-like pandemics, and other significant shocks. Thank you to all of our speakers and everybody who helped make this webinar possible. And thanks again to everyone for joining today. I'll now hand it over to Laura Evans from USAID's Center for Resilience. Thanks, Laura. Over to you. Good morning, good afternoon to all. Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, please meet yourself <laughs> if you're not speaking. Um, sorry, somebody's wandering my backyard, just in time for me to welcome you. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Michael. Um, as Jamie said, my name is Lara Evans. I am Social Protection Advisor based in the Center for Resilience within USAID. Um, I want to extend a warm welcome to each and all of you. We're so excited that you're here today. And I want to extend a particular welcome to um, our colleagues from the World Bank and from the government of Malawi who have graciously agreed to share their experience with us today. Um, using disaster risk financing to fund adaptive social protection and extend um, cash payments during times of crises. It's very timely, very innovative, and we're very excited to learn from them today. So allow me to introduce Evie Kalkat and Mulder Mukutumula. I practice that, Mukutumula. Evie is a qualified actuary from the World Bank's finance, competitiveness, and innovation practice. She's based in London and largely supports operations in East and Southern Africa, working with ministries of finance to improve their financial resilience to disaster shocks. Leading, She leads the development of analytical tools, which supports ministries of finance and their selection of financial instruments and supporting the development of disaster risk financing mechanisms such as scalable safety nets and agri-finance programs, which we'll be hearing about today. Evie has been a team member for the Malawi Social Support and Resilient Livelihoods Project since 2019. And Mulder Mukutumula 
is a disastrous finance specialist who works at the Scalable Safety Net Mechanism Coordinator at the National Local Government Finance Committee in Malawi. Mulder has been working on disaster risk management, humanitarian and social protection since 2010. Mulder brings a wealth of knowledge and insight to the table in these areas. He believes that faster support can reach the poor and vulnerable before the shock. The faster support can reach poor and vulnerable people before the shock, the less likely they are to resort to negative coping mechanisms and strategies. Mulder hold, holds a master's degree in international humanitarian action and an MBA in financial management. Evie, over to you. Thanks so much, Lara. Thanks everybody for joining. A uh, huge number of you. So um, yeah, great, great to be able to share with you all the work we've been doing over the last few years um, from the World Bank side, you know, working with um, our colleagues in the government of Malawi um, to, to make some of their programs more shock responsive. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. My role is um, quite easy in this presentation. I, I'm gonna give you a quick kind of um, whistle stop tour of, of what we've done in, the, in a kind of an exec summary format. We're then gonna play you a video um, because we produced a, a video to kind of summarize the broader project. And then Mulder is gonna really deep dive into some of the specifics of the uh, shock responsive element and, and making the, the safety net there uh, be able to react to, to, to shocks as they occur. Next slide, thanks. Um, so really the, the premise of this work is that the government of Malawi was seeing that there were shocks occurring and that they were reacting to those in terms of both kind of the response, um, but also financing. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to, to use the existing infrastructure, not reinvent the wheel, but use that infrastructure to uh, put in place a scalability mechanism, which is fully funded and has financing ready in place so they could get cash transfers out through, through that uh, social cash transfer program that they already have nationwide. So they've, they've worked on this in a phased approach and we're gonna to explain to you um, how, how we've been doing that. Next slide. So I'm coming from a disaster risk finance angle and I have colleagues on the call and, and beyond who are coming from this, from a um, social protection and we bring different skills and experiences. So as Lara said, I'm an actuary, so I've got a finance background, um, but I don't know that much about how you actually reach people through safety nets. So, so we had from the World Bank side, we had kind of mutually um, reinforcing expertise and the same was true um, for, for the government side. So disaster risk financing is the process of developing a strategy for uh, being able to respond to shocks financially. And then adaptive social protection is bringing in that financing as part of one of its kind of key pillars to make sure that you can reach um, poor uh, and vulnerable people during times of crisis. So it's this combination really that we've been able to, to integrate through the Social Support for Resilient Livelihoods project. Um, and actually the headline is that so far, you know, we've been implementing this um, in, in Malawi for, for two years and the government are able to cover uh, around 600,000 people with pre-funded, pre-agreed triggers for responding to uh, deficits in rainfall and, and food insecurity spikes. So, so that's where we are so far. And of course, there's, there's an uh, objective to go beyond. Next slide. To do this, you need to understand what the likely costs of your shocks are going forward. Very hard to design and budget how much you need for the following year or the following two, three years if you don't know the likelihood of, of shock. So that's where some of my expertise kind of um, complemented with the Ministry of Finance in Malawi came in to support those who are more familiar uh, with social protection um, and safety nets uh, to, to, to understand what this cost might be. So we were able to model it and we used um, other expertise as well. Um, to determine what, what would the financing plan be and what type of financing instruments um, should be used. And actually, in the case of Malawi, the government implemented a complement. So we've got risk retention and risk transfer. So we'll, we'll come to that as well. Next slide. Um, as I've said, this has been implemented now by the government for the last two years. Um, it took quite a while to get to the point of implementation. You know, disastrous financing and actually using social protection systems in this way um, it required 
quite a bit of learning uh, and global expertise and experiences from other countries to come together before the government felt confident to implement this. But, but they did that uh, last season and, and this agricultural season. They started with a smaller coverage covering three districts uh, and now they're building up to covering six of the most vulnerable districts and then um, want to expand nationwide eventually. Next slide. So this is the video. This video gives a broader context of the overall project that the government are, are implementing with support from the World Bank. Um, and then we'll deep dive a little bit on the scalable part afterwards. So I'll let uh, USA colleagues play this. Malawi, as we are now, poverty is quite pervasive because a significant portion of the population relies on rain fed smallholder agriculture. If you look at the international poverty line, then it's 75% of the population that lives below. And finding ways to make do in a setting like this can mean some very, very negative behaviors for the long term. The social support for resilient rifles project has got uh, four mutually enforcing components, and the biggest of uh, all components is uh, on improving social and economic inclusion, which simply is social safety needs, which are the social cash transfer program. In Malawi, we have the social cash transfer program, which is funded by several donors. The World Bank is supporting 129,000 households in 11 councils. The World Bank project is also supporting 435,000 households under the Climate Smart Public Works Program. Rivals comes in as a component that builds this resilience among the beneficiaries. And our approach is the savings first approach. On every ending they have, we need to save a little something before they start saving. Yeah. And then the last core intervention under that is the financing scale of sectors to help to respond to a common shock that Malawi experiences, which is drought. Before the disaster, we have the mechanism has got some triggering measures based on uh, rainfall data and food security. Good on the range of Munda o na o nonge ka gogo kwa mazi, dede na o tu pupa me, tina kwa mugo mazoje. The second component is formally called uh, strengthening harmonized delivery systems. It supports government to invest and implement its social registry, which is also called the Malawi Unified Beneficial Registry. It also supports Malawi government to introduce and roll out harmonized electronic payments. The third component is actually on capacity building and institutional strengthening of key implementing agencies, including the National Local Government Finance Committee. We do provide the guidance in terms of what the local authorities are supposed to follow and adhere to in terms of project key objectives. And the last component is contingent emergency response component to respond to shocks. These kinds of investments will become more embedded in the way national systems work, that we can do shock responsive approaches to anticipate and then put resources in place before crisis hits. Great, thank you so much for showing that. So um, uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of context, but that video is available online and there's actually a longer version as well. So we'll share a link to that. Um, 
but um, but also Mulder will will talk a, a little bit more about how what we're doing fits into to, to the overall project as well. Um, but before that, just a couple more slides. So next slide, thank you. Next one, thanks. So, I mean, I, I know we've got people on the, I can see from, from the chat popping up that people on this call are, are global. So not just from the, the Africa region. Um, so for, for your information, you know, Malawi, um, acutely prone to disasters, including floods, droughts, and storms. And over the last um, kind of several years, a number of shocks have happened and quite often concurrently. So the government's put in a very, very difficult situation to find the funding um, and the ability to reach people um, urgently uh, following these shocks. Next slide. Um, and these disasters, you know, they have huge, profound economic consequences, uh, consequences on poverty, uh, welfare, livelihoods. Uh, they they affect all different aspects of, of, of society within Malawi. So there's a huge number of impact channels that need to be addressed. Um, in particular, Malawi has a high dependence on rain fed agriculture. Um, so that kind of contributes to the issues when droughts and floods occur that filters through in, into affecting the you know, bottom lines, GDP, uh, jobs, other opportunities. Um, you know, 2014, there were huge floods hitting up to 5.2 percent of, of GDP. In, in 2016, there was a, a drought uh, that was a very prolonged drought, which had excessive uh, damages uh, hitting GDP, hitting lives and livelihood. 50% of the population were at risk of severe food insecurity. Now that was during an El Nino year, um, and that's coming up again. So huge concerns that we're going to see something similar in the next year. And then, and then in 2013, you may have seen you know, Cyclone Freddy, which hit Malawi and a number of other countries in, in the region, resulting in deaths and displacements and destroying certain facilities, health facilities, education facilities, housing. Um, so, this is not a kind of rare occurrence from Laos. This, this is a common occurrence, um, and it's, some, it's a real key reason why the government wanted to take a very a strategic um, approach to managing these risks. Next slide. Um, historically, when we're thinking about financing disaster response um it, as i said it's been very reactive in malawi and and, and you know this the, these comments here are based on discussions with with the ministry of finance but you know the the vote for unforeseen expenditures those contingencies is not adequate there's not enough funding um that means there are large reallocations of budgets um pulling money away from productive lines um there are a number of development partners and humanitarians in, in malawi but it can often be fragmented and, and, and slow to arrive. Um, and so there's a need to try to, to, to make a more coherent system. Historically, been very little prearranged funding. You know, these DRF instruments were not in place. So the government said, right, we need to, we need to shift this. We want to be more proactive. Next slide. So in 2018, um, with the support of the World Bank and other partners, they developed what they call their disaster risk financing strategy. Um, and their mission was to proactively manage the economic and fiscal risks, as well as protect public finances against disasters. And I'll just show you a, a kind of a, a snippet of, of the, the, the different instruments that they wanted to put in place under this strategy. Next slide. Um, so this is what we call a risk layering kind of strategy. So the idea is that you want different instruments for different types of shocks, and that can be different sizes of shocks, you know, big tropical cyclone that hits very rarely, but when it does has a huge impact, big El Nino induced droughts, you know, those low frequency but high severity events. Um, but then you've also got localized droughts, localized floods and storms that still need response, are still affecting people and, and, and hitting the local economies and the markets. So how do you match your financial instruments with those types of, um, uh, with those types of shocks? And the way the government decided to, to think about this was, Right. Some of these risks we can retain on our balance sheet and through our budget. We can have contingency funds and budget reallocation can be used where necessary. Not all the time, but 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 in some circumstances, small amounts of reallocation is acceptable. So that's their first layer in this chart. 
Um, then they, they wanted to have some more contingent type financing. So they actually um, in, in 2018 put in place a catastrophe drawdown option, which is a line of credit with the World Bank, which they were able to draw down for COVID and a couple of other events uh, that happened uh, between 2018 and, and 2022. Um, then they also wanted to explore sovereign risk transfer. So in the case of these more extreme shocks, they've been working with partners like African Risk Capacity and, and, and others to, to put in place policies that transfer that risk rather than having to, to retain the, the risk within the budget themselves. And the government wanted to, as part of their strategy, wanted to actually put something similar in place for managing social protection. Can we have a contingency fund for where we want to expand the safety net a little bit because there's some localised droughts or other shocks? And can we also have a risk transfer policy where actually we really have had a significant event and we want to scale up the financing delivered through the, the, the safety net in a big way? So we want to cover a number of districts uh, for a number of months. So they took a risk laid approach when coming up with the financing plan for, the, for this mechanism. Also, Anne Mulder is going to talk through that shortly. Thanks. Next slide. Um, in terms of food insecurity response, just to give you a little bit of a, um, uh, a kind of a status quo visual of how it was done before, because Mulder's going to explain how it's changed. Um, and on the right here is a, a visual that uh, the government worked on with, with Tetra Tech, a partner who did some analysis for them. But I want you to focus on the, the, the lean season part at the bottom. So this is a calendar and you've got the red blob at the bottom that shows lean season. So typically, lean season runs from November to, to March in Malawi. So there's, there's chronic need during those periods. Now, when there is a drought, um, uh, especially a severe one, this lean season is extended. So it comes forward and it starts earlier in the year, say, say August, and it pushes back to May. And it also covers, increases the number of people that are affected by it. So this is the type of situation where the government wants to say, we can foresee this happening in the lean season that's coming ahead. If we can provide some, some payouts in June, July, August, September, when um, uh, people are making those risk management decisions um, and, and avoid them making, ideally avoid them making those negative coping kind of uh, decisions, if we can provide those small amounts of cash, we can hopefully cushion this extension of the lean season. So that was one of the, uh, the timelines that the, the government had in mind. Thanks. Next slide. So now I'm going to uh, pass to, to Mulder. Uh, Mulder is um, really the scalability coordinator within the government on this social support for resilient livelihoods project. And he coordinates across the different uh, line ministries and, 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 and the Ministry of Finance uh, to make sure that this mechanism is, is running smoothly and, and, and that all of the processes that need to be followed uh, are followed. So over to you, Mulder. Uh, thank you, Eve. Uh, first, let me welcome you, you all uh, to the to the webinar. Uh, as Eve said, uh, my name is Mudan Kotmura, and I uh, scalable mechanism coordinator. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I'm going to talk about more about the where we are doing it, I call it the Malawian way, how we are doing the social support uh, in order to reach out to the vulnerable households. Um, how we are financing the social support for these scalable safety nets. Uh, next slide, please. So under the social support uh, for resilience library program or project, we have, uh, four components, as Chip already mentioned in the, in the video that you have seen, but I will dwell much on the financing scalable safety nets because that's the area that maybe we are interested to discuss today. So if you look at all those components that were as mentioned by Chip and also Eve, you see that we have the subcomponent 1.2, that is the one that we'll focus today. Next slide, please. So the issue here is to, for us to understand and clearly define the rules of scaling up uh, safety nets. 
We need to look at issues concerning with the allocating the budget, because as Evie mentioned already, what happens in the past is that when we have a drought or a shock, the government will go run around scrabbling here and there, getting the resources from the budget, reallocating it to respond to disasters. So by coming up with the, this uh, financing scalable safety nets, what is happening that we are in a position to preposition the, the food items or to disbase or credit funds to the vulnerable households on time before the shock happens. Because we are able to predict that, okay, this coming month or this year after the rainy season, these districts will be affected by the drought. Next slide, please. So in order for us to, to decide, we need first to decide to say, okay, when should we trigger? So it is important that we first look at and link the, the livelihood, food security, and the drought shocks. So over the past uh, 30 years, we looked at the data that was there in Malawi, including satellite data, as well as more subjective and local sources from uh, the meteorological uh, survey. Uh, after getting that data, we analyzed the data and then we come up with our models. Uh, we also use the data that is from outside Malawi and uh, from the other uh, uh, countries surrounding Malawi. For example, we use some of the data from Kenya, Tanzania. We all look at their data and how they are also working on it. Uh, on your right, you can see now uh, the, the index of the, uh, through historical trigger performance uh, for the past 30 years. Now we divided it into two. We have a uh, seasonal drought index and a full seasonal drought index. The 80 seasonal drought index starts on 1st November up to uh, 31st December. Then the full season starts from 1st uh, November up to 10th April every year. When it comes to 1st November, we start monitoring the rain patterns and they also we look at how it is collected by the image and also we use the satellite data. Next slide, please. So, after uh, evaluating all the data that we had, we ended up coming up with the scalable handbook. Now this book stipulates how we trigger, when we trigger, how we target the communities. And it also um, stipulates on the value of transfers, the transfer value, how much will each uh, household benefit and for how long. It also open, operationalized how things should be worked between the various government uh, ministries, who should do what, what's their responsibilities and their roles. Next slide, please. Now, when you look at that, we set up the parameters. If you look at the, on your left side, we have the vertical expansion and the horizontal expansion. Now, the horizontal expansion is what we call add-on. So these are additional households that we feel like they are not on the program. We have what we call on, on, the, on the left, the vertical uh, expansion. These are the regular beneficiaries. So all the beneficiaries under social cultural transfer program are already under the program of when we're looking at scaling up the social cash uh, transfers. So we know that in Malawi we have um, few, very few people under social cash transfers, but when the shock happens, it affects a lot of people. That's why we thought that we should have an additional households in order to reach out to uh, a large number of people. 
So that's what we use both vertical expansion and also horizontal expansion. Next slide, please. So uh, when you look at the geographical point of view is that the geographical targeting we have, we started with three districts as Eve mentioned, we started with Branta and Cheo and Cholo last year. But this year now we have added three more districts making it six. So what happens is in this area when you're targeting is that we look at 10% which of the households which are already under a social cash transfer program, then they add, we add 7% which is now additional households of the ultra poor in each and every of those th six districts. As I mentioned already, the transfer uh, amount is 25,000 kwacha, which is almost 24 uh, US dollars. And we agreed as the task force that the duration for the support that we give to the affected uh, households is for only three months. So every year when we trigger, it's always about the first three months. The reason why behind this is that we trigger for in, um, for example, if we trigger in May, we ensure that by the end of August, we should uh, transfer the funds to the service providers, then they will transfer it to the bank accounts or e-wallets of the beneficiaries. Uh, in Malawi, as you, Eve mentioned, the rainy season ends in, in, in April. So by transferring by March or June, July, August, the prices are still lower. So people can be able to procure food in preparation for the lean season. Next slide, please. So, the timeline for operationalizing the scalable safety nets is as follows, as you can see. Um, down there, if you look at the, the number one, that's early season rainfall. So this, the rains uh, ends by that time. So in February, we are able to see, have we uh, triggered? Uh, like last year, by December, one of the districts in Cheo district was already uh, triggered. And then they say there's a secondary rain season. Uh, there, the full season, that one goes up to April, then evidence review. Now, the evidence review, what happens here is that sometimes when you look at the satellite data that we normally use, it shows us that in that district, there was a rainfall. But when you do uh, ground truthing, you find out that there is a drop. Uh, this year we had the same uh, in one of the districts, Kalonga district, whereby when we look at the satellite data, it was giving us that the district received above average. But when you look at uh, the evidence on the ground, we noted that there were droughts between January and February. At the, at the same time, the district was hit by the floods. So apart from that, we also looked at the microeconomic uh, issues in the district. Then we are able to use the evidence review, which shows that in this district, indeed, there will be food insecure and the ultra poor people will not be able to procure food. That's why we trigger. So after we have done the uh, data collection and the monitoring, then we start, we draft a report. Uh, the report then is validated by the task force members who are, who are from various uh, ministries, department and agencies of the government. Then it is sent to the uh, economic planning and development whereby they authorize it. Then apart, uh, from there, it goes to the Secretary to Treasury to request for funds from World Bank. Then we communicate to the affected district, then the delivery of the funds. Then afterwards, we do monitoring and evaluation. 
So all that is within should be within the specific timelines, whereby we feel like if we delay, the prices of maize will go up. Uh, in Malawi, maize is the stable food. So if we delay disbursement of funds, we may have a challenge. Next slide, please. Now, as Eve already mentioned, uh, the government, we have procured a, a risk transfer product that is directly match the uh, triggering mechanisms within the con uh, with a contingency fund acting as deductible. Now, here what we, we noted is that uh, we cannot only base on one uh, risk rearing, whereby we can only not only base on the flexible contingency financing or the uh, disaster fund, which is coming from the unforeseen uh, circumstance uh, uh, vote from the uh, from the government, but we need also to have various uh, risk rearings. So this year we managed to procure. Uh, uh, a, a policy, insurance policy, uh, which is now uh, with the funds from uh, Global Shield, and we is supposed to start by the end of uh, November. So from November, we'll use the risk funding. Uh, another slide, please. So as I already mentioned, these are the the risk rate uh, finance plan. We have one uh, contingency fund. This is from the World Bank, um, which we have used for in the past uh, two years. So 2021, 2022 rainy season, we use contingency funding in order to trigger and disperse the funds to the affected districts, which were Cholo, Blantyre, and Chew. Uh, so this year, uh, for the 2023-2024 uh, rainy season, we are going to use the insurance that we have procured from ARC uh, with the resources from uh, Global Shield Financing Facility. Uh, as you can see, uh, the total amount is 10 million US dollars and it will cover uh, six districts. Uh, we anticipate that it will cover about um, 120 households in those uh, districts. Uh, next slide, please. Well, now, uh, experience. I think Eve has already mentioned this. Uh, in the past three, uh, in the three districts that if for 2021-2022 rainy season, uh, we covered uh, and reached out to 400,000 400, uh, people. Uh, and uh, we are anticipating that for the 2022-2023 drought, because uh, we have only triggered one district based on the evidence uh, review, we are going to cover up to 65,000 uh, households. Next slide, please. So based on the experience that we had uh, for 2021, 2022 season, as you can see, uh, the three districts that I mentioned uh, uh, earlier on, in Cheu, Blantyre, and Cholo. Uh, the scale up for every season, which starts for, as I mentioned, November to December, Nchew only had triggered, while Blanta and Cho did not. Uh, looking at the full season, uh, because this, after the, um, the every season, then we started receiving enough rains, so it, we could not trigger because the, uh, the district received above normal uh, average. Uh, when we used uh, evidence review to trigger, it, we noted that in the two districts, Choro and Blantyre, they were recommended for trigger because they were just uh, a miss. Uh, whereby, if you look at the indicators, it shows that the index showed that uh, 
the threshold for Cholo and the Granta was 45. So they just missed by 2%, 0.2% and 1.6, which is a near miss. So we also looked at the economic uh, factors. We noted that some of the areas uh, where we call the food basket for the southern region of Malawi, they were also affected by the, the cyclone, the three cyclones, Ana, Dumago, and Gombe. So if those uh, three uh, two districts in the southern part were affected, it shows that the Blanta and Chola districts were also likely to be uh, food insecure because of the challenges that there won't be enough food. And um, also, we also considered the macroeconomic factors over the agricultural uh, seasons, such as uh, the COVID-19, uh, the uh, Burkina War. Uh, also, we also looked at the fertilizer uh, prices, which were skyrocketing during that period. So the people could not manage to buy fertilizer to apply in their fields. So all these, considering all these, we ended up triggering all the three uh, districts. Uh, we used, in order to reach out to the community, we used about 3 point, I mean, 6.3 million uh, US dollars that was dispersed to the affected uh, households through the service providers. However, there were two issues that we also learned from this. Uh, one was the, despite the fact that we were ready to disperse, but uh, there were challenges with service delivery. Um, one was uh, the social registry not being ready, whereby the data was not uh, ready by the time we wanted to treat, uh, to disperse the resources. And also we had challenges with the service providers because they delayed in signing of the contracts. So this also delayed us in dispersing the resources to the affected communities. Next slide, please. Now for 2022, 2023 uh, season, in most of the districts, uh, in all six districts, um, any uh, seasonal uh, drought index showed that there was no trigger because all the districts received above uh, average rainfall. The same thing with the full season drought index. However, as I mentioned already, that after reviewing uh, the, the results, we noted that one district, Karonga, was affected. Because Karonga is uh, it's both drought prone and also flood prone. So during the rainy season in January and February, what happened is that there was a drought. After that drought, we had a few weeks, we have uh, erratic rains, then we had floods. So this affected the growing uh, season. At the same time, when the drought was coming in, that was a time where the crops were tassering and combing. So this affected the uh, average yield that the district produces. And we also looked at the other microeconomic factors. Uh, for example, the increased prices of uh, food in the district. Uh, this is one of the districts which is closer to the border to Tanzania. So in most of the cases, the food prices are always high in that district. Um, on this one, on the, for Karonga, we, we have finalized the report. Uh, we have sent it to the authorities. However, we anticipate that uh, we are going to spend about 0 0.9 million uh, to dispense from the contingency fund to make the transfers. Uh, another area uh, why we are uh, not yet dispersing the resources is that um, we had an issue. So 
we could not manage to do the data collection. Uh, now we have agreed that we are going to scale up the public works uh, program whereby the participants under the public works are going to benefit from the scaling up uh, of the social cultural transfers. So we are going to use the public works uh, beneficiaries. Uh, next slide, please. Lesson learned. Um, here is where now we need, uh, as, a, as, a, as a government, we thought that we need to establish the rules and ways on how we are going to speed up the response. As I mentioned already, our aim is that soon after the, or before the shock, we should be in a position to displace the funds so that people can procure maize uh, or, and also other items in, in readiness for the lean season. So if you look at the, the timelines, we start, the, the lean season in Malawi is always from September going up to January sometimes much, depending on the severity of the, of the drought. So our aim is to ensure that we speed up the displacement, the response, so that the people, the affected communities are in, in a position to procure uh, food. Next slide, please. So another area that we focused much was on uh, to ensure that this program is government led. So despite the fact that we had uh, technical assistance from uh, various institutions, but we made it a point that it should be government led, we should be in a position to understand and to agree as a government to say, this is what we want to do. So to improve this, what we did was that uh, we, we have a team that, as I mentioned, the task force team, which is comprised of members from uh, various government uh, offices, we always meet, discuss, and agree on what, uh, or, and agree on the way we want to move. Next slide, please. As I mentioned already, we have the agreed. Um, rules uh, so at the end of the season we make sure that uh, we have all the resources available and the, we always engage our, our senior government to discuss on how to disperse the resources so after triggering, for example, we have already triggered this year, we have triggered Karonga. What we have done is that we have met with the community, I mean, the district council. We have also met with the uh, senior government officials to brief them so that they should be in a position when they are requesting resources from the World Bank, they should be in a position to understand what and why and when. So that's how we have established the rules and uh, uh, another area that we have also uh, put in place is on how the resources will flow. So as I already mentioned, uh, the resources, the flow is from uh, World Bank to National Local Government Finance Committee, the NIE. from National Government Finance Committee, we disperse it to the service providers in each and every district. Another slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, this is another area that we need to improve um, the delivery systems. Because we may have the resources ready, but if the delivery systems are not ready, at the end of the day, uh, we may uh, waste a lot of time and the the situation uh, in the, uh, among the households will get poorer and poorer. So if at the end of the day, you find out that the uh, households will start now selling their assets 
in order to survive. So to avoid that, we need to put a lot of resources uh, in terms of financial and also hum uh, human resource in order to improve the systems. So as I already mentioned that uh, we have the social registry whereby we, we use the emergency uh, information system management to get the data about the districts, about the beneficiaries, then we send it to the uh, service provider for know your customer. From there, now they send us to produce the uh, uh, payroll. Another slide, please. Um, yeah. On this one, uh, procuring of insurance products, Indeed, it requires time and extra support. Um, we, when we started in 2020, we thought that it would be a simple process, but it takes time because there are different issues that are happening behind the scene. Uh, there was a time whereby we had a challenge with the issues concerning the legality, the legal issues, uh, whereby we have the Malawian laws and also the World Bank uh, issues. So when you look at the two, they were either like in conflict, but at the end of the day, we had to resolve them because the Malawian laws say that you cannot um, procure from outside, but we look at it we discussed and also we came up to agree that it is okay for us now to procure um, insurance from any other, because what we wanted to do is to just to open it up for various uh, insurance uh, houses to bid for the uh, insurance uh, service. So at the end of the day, it took us almost two to three years now for us to now to have the product in hand. So for this year, as I mentioned, we are going to use the insurance. Um, we have also support from various uh, insurance organizations within Malawi who supported us throughout this uh, process. So. It, uh, it indeed it needs time for us to invest. I mean, it, we need more time to invest on this. Um, another slide, please. Yeah. Uh, with this support from uh, Global Shoot, uh, we were able now to procure the, the insurance, as I already mentioned, that uh, we, we received as a grant about 10 million US dollars that uh, we have used to procure the, the insurance. Now, this insurance is not only for this year, but it is also for 2024, 2025. So it's for two years. We also had, um, in order for us to reach where we are, we also have uh, support from various uh, international insurance companies. Uh, we had a meeting with, uh, um, some companies in London, where we also they have helped us to see to panel bid the the bid and also to see what exactly we wanted to get. So, with the support from them, we are uh, we are where we are today. Next slide, please. Oh, let me stop there for the time being. Uh, if there are questions, uh, my colleagues, Bessie, Chipo, uh, Eve are uh, here, they'll help us. Uh, but before that, maybe I could ask Eve if uh, there's something you have left out. Over to you, Eve. Thanks, Mulder. I will pass to Lara. I think we get into the Q&A and then we'll cover what we missed. Thanks so much. 
Thank you both Evie and Mulder so much for your presentation. We do have um, several questions in the Q&A and I will um, invite participants to continue to put questions in there while we start to answer them. Um, so let's see. Mulder, a big one. I'm not going to do these in order. I'm just going to take the liberty of being a facilitator to answer interesting ones. Um, so what question for you, Mulder, is, and actually, um, Mulder and Evie, if you guys want to turn your cameras on, and also Chipo and Bessie, I'll invite you to turn your um, cameras on. Um, and I think Chipo and Bessie introduced themselves in, in the chat, but when I punt a question to you, I will, I will ask you to introduce yourself verbally. Um, I don't know if Bessie's still here. Anyway, so Mulder, um, are there any deliberate steps to move beyond shock responsive towards adaptive social protection and climate resilient livelihoods? <laughs> if you don't want to answer it, punt it to Chipo. <laughs> Mulder, you're on, you're on mute. <laughs> um, oh, I think if you or Chipo, can you take that one? <laughs> so, Chipo, to you, what are the plans to move beyond shock responsive social protection to adaptive social protection and climate resilient livelihoods? So, uh, actually, actually, when you reflect back to one slide that, um, oh, let me, yeah, my name is Chipo, I'm a senior social protection specialist and uh, a task team leader for the Social Support for Resilient Livelihoods Project. Uh, and and the, this is one of those components that uh, is uh, the topic of discussion. So quickly, what are the plans to move towards uh, climate resilient livelihoods? Um, I would say we've kicked in, into motion some of the aspects, and I think this also responds to a good number of the questions that have been put. Uh, in the chat box. First, if you reflect on the slide that um, um, uh, Muda showed, as well as the, the, the short video, you have seen that we have a number of interventions, and these interventions were designed with the understanding that, that they are mutually reinforcing. So on the adaptation side, we have actually a climate smart enhanced public works program, which is now the biggest safety net program that we have in Malawi. And it's built and designed around integrated catchment management. Simply put, focusing on restoring integrated catchment and landscapes. And I, I think that's, that to us is the, uh, is the core intervention around uh, adaptation. We are hoping that this eventually evolves to also shape quite, um, uh, uh, a number of aspects on livelihoods. First, most of the interventions that we're working in, downstream, there are a number of our uh, private sector uh, beneficiaries. We want to get to a path where they should actually be seeing the benefit of paying for equal services. And the benefits should be trickling back into uh, uh, the communities as part of their livelihoods, but also, by focusing on um, the topical issue of uh, 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 climate resilience and uh, climate smart public works, we are, we are starting to build in new skills in the communities, right? We're talking of interventions that people were, did not have um, skills in, garden reclamation, uh, soil construction, infiltration pits, um, soap pits, storm drains. So all these soil and water conservation skills that we are imparting in the, in the beneficiaries, as well as on forestry, just the horticultural aspects and the, the agroforestry, nursery establishment. Now, these, I think, should be skills that ultimately should not just be skills for creating community assets, skills that also they can actually use for employment. And that's a discussion that we, we hope to embark with Lara and others uh, uh, in the next couple of months. But beyond that, what we've also seen and what's already happening is, given our focus on uh, public works, where we are regenerating natural forests and all that, 
the community has actually been trained in beekeeping. They have uh, put in a lot of hives, and we expect that since we started in November, December 2022, later this year, we should have uh, some mushrooming livelihoods around uh, honey and, uh, and uh, other beekeeping products uh, springing up. So yeah, definitely something that's uh, already been uh, thought through. Thank you for that. Um, there was another question, but it's very similar. So I'll, I'll just ask it, Chipo, and if you have anything to add on to it, um, which was from Theodoros Kebele in Ethiopia, um, basically saying, you know, sort of the value of environmental restoration and how can we um, use environmental restoration to enhance disastrous management and, and improve community resilience. So I think that you kind of answered that, but if you have any other thoughts, I'll, I'll let you add them. No, I, I think I think largely, uh, I think that answers to the adaptation and the role of uh, the role of uh, uh, climate smart public works. So just to, to 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 give you a reflection that when you, if if one looks at the evolution of the project, and looks at the uh, adaptive septic elements, the project had a stronger focus on the coping and mitigation and didn't have a stronger focus on adaptation. And that's where now public works was ushered in. The stronger element that we're discussing today on, um, on uh, uh, linking social protection and disaster risk financing enhanced the mitigation aspects. And then the regular safety needs actually propped up the coping mechanism. So when you look at it, it's, it's actually quite a holistic project. And we hope that uh, uh, in the next couple of years, we'll now be bringing out uh, hard evidence on what impacts these pillars are, are achieving. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Bessie, I don't know if you are able to turn on your camera, but I have a question for you, if possible, um, which is around... Um, Mapping and analysis of shocks in, in Malawi show that food price shocks um, are often more significant than, um, or are, are often a significant driver of natural hazards. Um, and so the question is, is, is there consideration for including price shocks as part of the basket of shocks that would be used as a trigger? And Bessie, please introduce yourself. Thank you. If Bessie's not here, I'm happy to, to start. She is here. She took herself off mute and then went back on mute. So I don't know. Go ahead, Evie. Start unless Bessie pops in. <laughs> yeah, let me let me just say two comments and then just, Bessie uh, will. Uh, ah, Bessie, here you are. You're traveling. Bessie, yeah, would you to start? <laughs> sorry, network challenges. Can I? Can you repeat the question? What is it? Yeah, so basically the question was, is, is there consideration of adding um, food price shocks as part of the trigger indicators to the scalable social safety nets? Bessie, you're still on mute, I think. Yeah, this is, I think he's in the field, so she might be having intermittent connection. So if you can help, and then when she's back online, she can uh, weigh in. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so just, it's just two quick points, and then uh, Mulder and, and, and others can compliment, but I think it's, it's an incredibly important point. Um, we, the, 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 the purpose of, you know, making a a safety net shock responsive is, um, uh, you know, it's it, it ideally it would be able to respond to a range of shocks. And when the government started doing their analysis on, uh, you know, where what shocks do we really want to focus on? Drought and food insecurity caused by drought was the really key um, focus because of the evidence that shows that has the biggest impact in a number of ways. Um, but it was very much acknowledged that that's not going to be a perfect mechanism. There will be times where there is flooding in the north um, uh, and drought in the south. 
how do we build a flexible mechanism that's able to respond to, to different perils, but as you said, different types of shocks. So following the um, uh, COVID and then the situation in Ukraine, you know, price shocks have also been a, a big um, a big issue on, on the mind of the government. So when they were, were designing this mechanism, uh, as Mulder was saying, there's these two kind of triggers. There's the more parametric, hard trigger, as we call it, which is very much objective based on data that's independent and, and has been carefully selected uh, due to its correlations and its the information that it's able to proxy for in terms of, of drought and food insecurity. Um, the secondary mechanism is what we, we sometimes call it the fail safe, but essentially it's what if we miss something related to the primary uh, peril of drought? What if that parametric trigger doesn't quite work? Because we're still we're still learning about how to use this information. But also, what if there's something else? What if there is a tropical cyclone or there is, you know, a, a, an issue with um, um, uh, uh, yeah, food price shocks, etc. So we wanted to build in the secondary fail safe mechanism that had some flexible funding. So whilst the, the operations manual gives a very clear um, uh, kind of rules and prescribes the process that the government has to follow and the parametric triggers. There is also built into that some flexibility and contingency. Uh, and as Mulder said, the, the first time that the mechanism triggered in, in um, Tiolo and, and, and Blantyre and in Cheu, some of it was due to the parametric triggers being met, but some of it was due to a much broader analysis that showed that, that these districts and people within the districts were really struggling because of the increases in, in prices. And so there was a decision made to, to, to scale up. Now, despite that decision being made after the event, having the operational handbook in place and having the financing in place that was flexible still sped up the process and they were able to make that decision very quickly. Um, so, so absolutely, this is already incorporated. Could it be incorporated in a more parametric way? Potentially. But that is much harder to model. And so there's more work to be done. I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you. That's great. Um, Chief Bowman, I come, <clears throat> excuse me, back to you and then I'll go to Mulder. There's a question about um, what has been the experience of SSRLP's collaboration with humanitarian response, particularly in the vertical and horizontal expansion. So how, how is the safety net um, working with other disaster response mechanisms such as humanitarian response? I, I, I noted that Eve was, uh, had responded that she wants to pick that up. So if you want to. No, 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 you go ahead, Chipo. I was responding on your behalf. And I think, I'm sure Mulder wants to say something as well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, good, good. I think, I think first to appreciate that, uh, I think if you look at this aspect as part of the broader shock responsive uh, uh, agenda in Malawi, it's specific to one hazard, right? And then there are also other hazards that are coming in. Uh, and, 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 and what we've seen over time is that actually, in terms of starting to change the thinking of um, how government or how donors rally around responding to drought and the drought-related food insecurity, I think, this is now becoming more the model that more people are being aligned. And we have an advantage of setting up uh, a multi-donor trust fund, which is really leveraging this discussion. Now, what we have seen, for instance, in the most recent food insecurity, uh, uh, in season food insecurity response, this has been, has been treated as core part of responding to food insecurity, right? In that they are, they are I'm, I'm trying to find the right word, they are discounting people that are already being reached out on the basis of the response that's coming out from the scalable safety needs and then handling everyone else as part of the existing uh, uh, in season response with the hope and the evolution that eventually lean season most of the in season response is going to be transitioning to the mechanism that government is laying down through this scalable 
uh, scalable mechanism. So the VE reaching out to existing cash transfers, uh, beneficiaries of public works under the scalable mechanism is more or less replicated by what's being done on the on the lean season that they reach out to the existing cash transfers and then uh, those that are affected and beyond the existing beneficiaries are part of the horizontal expansion. Similarly, as Muda, Muda explained, under the scalable, we also designed and recognize that drought affects more than the existing beneficiaries of safety nets. So we also reach out to, to uh, uh, non safety net beneficiaries. The tweak that's there now is with the um, safety net coverage increasing with the rollout of public works, it's being realized with the catch that the financing envelope is the biggest determinant of, of how far you can reach. That mostly, if you do a vertical expansion, so reaching out to existing beneficiaries of cash transfer and public works, more or less exhaust a significant chunk of the resources that are there, such that the horizontal expansion is becoming much more minimal. Right, compared to a situation where previously the only certain program that was there was cash transfer. So it meant that you had quite a bigger case load that you could identify as horizontal expansion beneficiaries. Now that case load is becoming minimal because public works is also reaching out quite a significant. So yeah, quite a complementary uh, relationship that's there between scalable and uh, and the other humanitarian interventions. Great, thank you. Um, Mulder, a question for you is, the mechanism seems focused on droughts in specific districts. Is there a plan to scale this up further to other risks in other areas? Yeah. Um... We, we are thinking of um, scaling up to other districts. Uh, as I mentioned already, some of the districts uh, in Malawi are flood prones and uh, others are drought prone. Now, why, the question is why we focus on drought? Because it's so easier for us to predict that there'll be a drought than uh, predicting that there'll be a flood. So as a learning process, that's when we started, so that let's start with uh, baby steps. Let's start with the uh, the drought, then we'll move on to other uh, uh, shocks. So currently, we are also working with uh, other institutions so that we can move over to 28, all the 28 districts. So this, we are trying to look at what are the other uh, uh, insurances that are there you know, within the government because we know that there are some insurances and there are other institutions that are also working on the same. So by coming together, we are thinking that we may reach out to the, all the 28 districts. Over. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Um, we are almost at time. I know there are, there are more questions. So I just want to commit to you that we will answer these questions in writing and that you will get answers if they have not been answered in the chat or the Q&A directly. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone so much for taking the time to join us today. And I hope that you found this information um, inspirational, inspirational and replicable. I hope you will consider how you might apply this in your own context. Um, and you know, just to say that we'll be sharing a copy of the slides and the event recording following this event, as well as answers, as I mentioned. Um, and I just, you know, wanted to say, sort of in closing, um, you know, Michael opened the event talking about the importance of social protection's role and how it relates to building resilience. And just to say that, you know, USAID really sees social protection policies and programming as, as critical tools to manage risk and to build and strengthen resilience. Um, you know, sort of the dual nature of social protection's ability to sustain people during 
times of crises, as well as provide for you know well-being and dignity um, to achieve basic needs and in, in, in everyday life um, really is linked to USAID's mission to promote inclusive development, economic growth, improved health outcomes, um, inclusion and, and, and equity. So um, we were very excited to learn about what was happening in Malawi. And, and I mean, as Chico said, we're gonna be continuing this conversation and USAID recently joined the multi-donor trust fund um, and this integration between disaster risk financing and social protection and how they can help one another to reach people that disaster risk financing has a challenge reaching in a timely and effective manner and to help finance the scalability of social protection when that's difficult to do out of national budgets. So thank you so much for your time, for your interest and um, we hope to see you at our next event. And if you want more information, you can also check out Resilience Links, we have a new uh, social protection page and we've got um, a lot of resources posted on there. So thank you so much. Thank you, Laura, thanks everybody. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you.